Hello and welcome. Uh, I'd like to start today by thanking our organizers of the EDA Summit Solace uh, for inviting us and giving us the opportunity to share with you some principles and guidelines that we've used uh, to shape the architecture and design of electronic trading systems. Uh, what I'd like to do today is, is, is walk you through a particular use case uh, of a trading system that, that we've worked on before, uh, show you the actual architecture that we used, um, and talk about some principles and guidelines that we employed while building uh, this particular architecture and system. And I, finally, I'll wrap up with a few examples of how we applied these principles to the architecture and how the architecture enables these principles. So my name is Apu Shah. I'm a partner at 28 Stone Consulting. Uh, I've been designing, developing, architecting, uh, trading platforms and data platforms for over two decades. Uh, 28 Stone is a fintech custom software consulting company. Uh, we deliver custom software to capital markets uh, industry participants. Uh, we've delivered over 100 fintech projects at, at this point, and uh, we have over 200 experts on our staff. Uh, during this history, we've developed uh, from scratch many trading platforms across asset classes continue to do so, actively involved uh, in, in the building of these uh, platforms. And over these years, we've, we've gained some very valuable insights. Uh, knowledge has been acquired regarding what works, what doesn't work, you know, pitfalls to avoid, things to embrace, so on and so forth. And all of these architectures and implementations that we've put together uh, differ slightly based on the use case. However, uh, the principles that underlie uh, the architectures and the implementations are, are fairly constant. Uh, the industry, obviously, technology has progressed uh, over the last 10 years, 20 years uh, since we've been building these systems. Uh, so what we do is uh, periodically we reevaluate our choices we make tweaks, we swap out technologies and, and techniques and patterns and things like that uh, as things are progressing uh, in the industry. So having said that, let's talk about what principles are in terms of architecture. So we define the architectural principles as a set of stated concepts, patterns and goals that a system should adhere to while meeting the specified functional requirements. So what does this actually mean? Let's, let's take a deeper look at, at what these principles actually are. First, uh, the first point about principles is while principles may be constant and consistent across platforms, they are not one size fits all. The, the system requirements or the, the functional requirements have a very heavy influence on, on the, the principles themselves, as well as the degrees of tolerance you may adopt for that particular use case and set of requirements. Principles also are just guidelines. Uh, they are not designs. They are not uh, implementation details. They're simply guidelines. They, they provide you a track to follow and to keep in mind when you're in your design phase. And what that enables is focus. It, it allows you to kind of narrow down the choices for your solution architecture and, and not uh, have such a broad uh, set of choices uh, that you need to evaluate and consider while you're in the design phase. And because of that, it does bring a lot of clarity to the approach uh, it solves for ambiguity, uh, and it just makes it smoothens the path of designing such systems. 
with that, I'd like to talk about this specific use case that I'd be presenting on today. Uh, so the use case is for a CLOB exchange. A CLOB is a central limit order book exchange. It uses an auction trading modality, a very typical auction trading modality. It could be you know, continuous uh, auctions or real-time matching, or it could be a time box trading session uh, where the matching occurs at the end of the session. So what the CLOB exchange uh, does is that it maintains what is known as an order book uh, per financial instrument or also referred to as a market. Uh, and market participants essentially submit buys, sells, bids, offers into the exchange uh, for particular instruments and the exchange maintains this book of instruments. And when uh, when the auction is activated or whenever the auction needs to uh, match, uh, the exchange evaluates the order book, uh, matches uh, orders on opposite sides of the market and executes or generates trades from matching orders. So pictorially, this is how it looks. There's a centralized uh, order book, market participants submit bids and offers. And as they're submitting their bids and offers, uh, it generates the order book. And, and as you can see uh, pictorially, uh, it's, it's ordered by uh, sells and, and buys uh, by price. Now, if the buys and sells cross each other in terms of price, that's when trades actually happen. So while building uh, for this use case, uh, we came up with a set of principles, which we explicitly stated. And these are the principles that, that we would like to achieve in whatever architecture we uh, put together. Uh, the explicitly stated principles are as follows. There's the availability principle, which means the systems and the services should be highly available. Any service invocation should always return a response. Stateful services uh, should run in one master and replica types of configurations and stateless services should be redundant. Uh, re the recovery principle states that, that any service should be able to recover from uh, either a failure or a restart intraday. Uh, and then services that are stateful uh, may require them to rebuild state, uh, which may actually involve ordering of messages and things like that. And so these types of services should be able to recover uh, even in the event of uh, catastrophic failures by rebuilding state and respecting the ordering of the messages. The item potency principle essentially states that services should be able to detect and discard duplicate messages. Uh, again, if uh, messages are processed twice, uh, that could lead to a whole bunch of other problems. And we do want to make sure that no matter what the input is, the output is always the same. The scalability principle, fairly uh, self-explanatory. Uh, stateless services should just scale by adding more instances, whereas the stateful services, uh, you should be able to uh, allow n number of one plus n replica configurations uh, with appropriate partitioning and sharding. The Deployment flexibility principle states that we should be as flexible as possible with the architecture so that it can be deployed in a range of different uh, deployment targets. That could be on-prem, it could be pure cloud, it could be hybrid, it could be multi-cloud. We should design the system in such a way that we can take pieces of the system and move them around uh, data centers, clouds, uh, without too much of effort. The event-driven principle, again, we want all of uh, the, the, the whole architecture should be event-driven based on events, real time in nature, um, uh, asynchronous through and through all the way to the front end. 
The security principle uh, states, uh, kind of obvious what it states, but the security principle is everything should be secure. Uh, the important point I wanna raise with the security principle though, is that this also covers uh, user access control and entitlements. So one way of achieving this, uh, again, during the design phase, you'd flush this out, but one way of achieving it is by using conditionals in your code saying, you know, if you are a, a trader, then you can do this. If you are a manager, you can do these other things. Uh, we wanna try and avoid that. So the security principle also states that all of the, the access control should be somewhat native to the architecture and it, you should avoid polluting your code uh, with uh, security conditionals or entitlement conditionals. Standard network and um, uh, transport security, encryption, uh, data at rest, sensitive data at rest should also be encrypted. Portability principle states uh, that message flows, uh, we, there should be a capability of taking message flows from one environment and, and playing them in another environment. Uh, so uh, this uh, covers some ability to capture these messages and send them to another environment. The message model, so we want the message model to be um, not monolithic and it should be insulated from change, forward and backward compatible, and finally simplicity. So we, we wanna try and minimize as much as we can the number of technologies we use, the number of products, open source libraries, et cetera. And we wanna try and rationalize these technologies and leverage uh, as much as we can from a smaller set of uh, technical choices here. Now, if you read between the lines, you'll see that the these principles are explicitly stated, but they do imply a whole set of other implicit principles, uh, things like failover, fault tolerance, DR capability. So between availability, recovery, item potency, uh, and scalability, you can you can see that between the lines, we are actually achieving some other principles that are not explicitly stated. So with that, let's look at the actual architecture. So I couldn't fit the whole architecture on, on, the, on the slide. So I've split it into two halves here. Uh, on the left side, you see the presentation tier. And on the right side, you see the back end and downstream tiers. Um, I'll get into both of these uh, tiers a, a little more in detail, but I do want to point out a few things here. One is it's cloud ready. Uh, it can be deployed uh, on-prem, uh, in, in the cloud fully, hybrid, multi-cloud. The tiers are structured in such a way that it's, it's possible to do that. Uh, we do use Solace as a backbone here. Uh, so queues uh, guarantee the ordering of the messages when we consume them in that fashion. Uh, because we are using Solace, again, we're enabled to use the hardware appliances if we really need to kind of uh, extract uh, very, very high performance. Uh, the software brokers have worked and worked well for us so far. We haven't had to do that yet. Uh, also, we, because of the use of Solace here, uh, you know, we have persistent message flows like order flows, we have non-persistent messaging. So it's a unified QoS quality of service within the, the same solution. And finally, the services and the service groups can be scaled. You can, we can add instances, we can remove them uh, within a tier without impacting other tiers. And the message model, again, it's not monolithic, so it allows for this phased uh, backward compatible evolution. So let's take a deeper look right now at the presentation tier. Uh, so the presentation tier basically consists of uh, three service groups, uh, the static asset group, which is basically a web farm serving up your HTML, JavaScript, CSS, that type of stuff. Um, I've left load balancers out of the picture for simplicity, but there are load balancers in there too. Uh, the next uh, set on the right are fixed gateways. So those are for the API clients to connect and interact with the trading platform. 
And finally, in the middle is where the meat is. Uh, there's uh, a cluster of UI gateways. Uh, these somewhat follow the BFF pattern, which is the back end for front end pattern uh, serving clients. And we use uh, PubSub plus cash, Sol cash, uh, to provide the state of the market um, uh, to the connecting clients. On the back end side, uh, we have various service groups, each uh, providing a specific set of functionality for the trading platform. Uh, there's a mixture of configurations. Some of them are stateful, some of us are stateless. Uh, depending again on the requirements around the messaging, there's a combination of RPC, uh, pub sub, there's persistent messaging, guaranteed messaging. Uh, again, depending on the service group and the requirements, uh, a combination of these things are used. Uh, we also use uh, browse only queues. So these are queues where consumers can read in a non destructive fashion, and we use uh, this type of technique for state, uh, state recovery, um, where they can rewind uh, from the start of day and build up state. And finally, there's a downstream tier, uh, which deals with things like long-term persistence, uh, post-trade, uh, data laking, data warehousing, analytics, visualization, so on and so forth. And the, the important thing about the architecture is all of the, the principles that we describe also apply to the downstream tier, even though they're not shown in this picture. So now that you've seen the architecture, why don't we take a look at, at three particular principles that I mentioned and let's see how the architecture supports those principles. The first one I wanna talk about is high availability. Um, so the statement is straightforward. Services must be highly available, but there are two types of services here. There are the uh, stateless services, which uh, need to be redundant, uh, spin up more instances to get more availability. In this, we use uh, topic to queue binding. So what that allows us to do is we can uh, separate groups of uh, uh, publishers uh, on, on different topics, publishing down on topics. Uh, the, the consumers, it's comp competing consumer pattern here. So any one of these instances will pick up the message. It's round robin uh, bal uh, load balance uh, between these pricing service instances. One instance will pick it up, process it, go out the next, uh, request that comes in will go to the next one and so on. So these things can be taken up and down during the day uh, without any impact. It'll automatically balance uh, between the existing uh, surviving uh, instances. Stateful services on the other hand are a little bit more complicated because there is one master process or primary instance that is actively processing these messages with N standbys or replicas ready to take over if the primary goes down. So in this, we use uh, Solace's exclusive queue binding mechanism, which has uh, this notion of an active flow indicator. And, and what that, uh, well, the way that that works is that all of these instances can attempt to bind to the endpoint, to that queue, but that queue is marked as an exclusive queue. The access type is exclusive, which means that only one of these instances will actually receive these messages and be able to process them. The other ones are just waiting. They're connected to the queue, but they're just waiting. Uh, there's an active flow indicator callback that is uh, supplied by Solace to one of these instances. And when that instance receives the active flow indicator, it knows that it's master and it can start processing the messages and sending out the responses. The other ones are just waiting. If that primary process goes down, uh, the active flow indicator gets delivered to another instance, which then picks up from where the first one failed. And the nice thing about this is that it, it forms the basis of our leader election and master failover uh, technique. 
Uh, we don't have to write any extra code per se to figure out who's the leader, uh, to figure out when a failover event happened. It's all kind of native to Solace and the architecture. The second principle is was about deployment flexibility. So in the diagram here, you can see that I've split uh, I've, I have two presentation tiers running in different regions, but through the use of, of Solace uh, event meshing and dynamic message routing, essentially we've extended the bus across multiple cloud regions, uh, but it behaves as one bus. It's a global bus. Uh, there's global caching involved, which again leverages the mesh, uh, the event mesh and dynamic message routing to keep the caches up to date. And uh, there's finally, there's GeoDNS routing. So clients connecting in will get routed to the region closest to them, which will then use all the components in that region. And through the use of Solace, again, you know, we can extend the bus globally. Uh, so this is very powerful. And you can you can spin up as many of these as you need. You can spin up multiple backends too, if you want, uh, through event meshing and dynamic message routing. This all becomes very nice and easy. And finally, uh, the last principle I wanted to talk about today is the event-driven principle. Uh, so this, uh, it, it took us a little bit of time to kind of fully embrace and fully adopt end-to-end uh, -end event driven uh, architecture where even on the front end, we are fully event driven. We're, we're, we're fully asynchronous on the front end as well. And again, a lot of it is thanks to the use of uh, Solace uh, JavaScript libraries. The, the JavaScript library from Solace on the front end has a very consistent kind of programming model. Uh, so whether you're on the front end or back end, you're, you're publishing and subscribing, you're getting messages, pub, you know, processing messages. Uh, the topic naming is consistent. Uh, the modeling of the messages or, or the formats of the messages are also consistent. Uh, so it's a very nice, clean, unified type of uh, uh, technique to use across these uh, you know, front end presentation, back end tiers. So with that, I, again, I've only touched on a, a very small subset of uh, details uh, related to these principles. We do have a full white paper on our website, uh, which you may download from uh, this link. Uh, and finally, you know, we've uh, as I mentioned, we've been doing this for many years at this point. Uh, we, we do have a lot of knowledge in, in this space. So if you're having trouble with your trading system or you need help with it, uh, please do look us up uh, and please reach out. Uh, we, we'd be thrilled to help.